was kind of cool. It was, it was different. It was new. On a Sunday, I think you always have to have some songs. Some, you always have to have some music. So I would say if you only have one song, one guy who leads songs, uh, he needs to just pray that God leads us to baptize some more good musical people, but he, he's got to suck it up and, and work at it and, and do the very best he can. Um, because that's his gift and he's the only one who's got it in that group, so you've got to use whatever gift you've received to serve others. And I think that's the mindset. Uh, the excellence thing, I think, I think you... Uh, in English, uh, we have this expression, we say, uh, you, you got to dance with who brung you, which means you got to work with the tools you have. Uh, and if you have great musicians, you work with the great musicians, and if you have B minus musicians, not so good, then you work with the, the B minus C plus musicians. And you just encourage them to, to work at it and to improve and to get better. Maybe you send them for training. Uh, maybe you, you pay for them to have music lessons. Uh, pay for them to have vocal lessons. Uh, you, you send them to Atlanta, Georgia and say, spend a week with Sherwin McIntosh and, and learn how to do it right, you know. Or you send them to, in your case, you send them to Copenhagen and, and say, oh, you know what, Esben will be glad to have you stay at his house. <laughs> uh, one month at a time, yes. So that's, that's how I would do that, yes. I just really wanted to uh, hear a little bit more about the feedback. What's, uh, if you could give me an example, um, an experience of yours, or just give me um, an advice how to encourage feedback. Because um, I think in our church, uh, when we get feedback, it's always, always nice, at least that's what I, I experienced. It's always, always nice. The feedback positive, is okay. positive. Mm -hmm. if, that's something goes, yeah, but <laughs> if something goes wrong, it's it's than hard. always being negative. It's yes. hard to encourage people to be objective. Just sure, sure. Just uh, well, what, one thing we do, we do this about once a year, is we take a poll. Uh, we, we write a questionnaire. We do a questionnaire. And we put it out to the church and we say things like, uh, what subjects would you like us to cover in our teaching in 2014? Uh, comment about the worship. What do you like about the worship? What do you not like about the worship? Uh, do we use... Too much band, not enough band. Do you want uh, to see notes on a page or do you like the lyrics on the screen? So we'll, we'll ask those questions about once a year and we'll do it anonymously. Uh, no, they don't have to sign their name to it so they can say, I think your band stinks and I hope you never sing again. Uh, if that's what they feel, they can say that and you won't you know, get a gun and go shoot them uh, because you don't know who wrote it. So, uh, you know, but I think we need to, I think we need to invite, we need to invite people to do that. And I think the best way to do it is in writing. But, uh, but you can also incur, you know, if a person comes to you and they seem like they have a feeling, you can just ask them, hey, tell me what you feel about the worship at church. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What do you think we could do better? What would meet your need better? Um, you know, like we have some people in our church that love four-part acapella harmony. They just love it. I could live without it. I like it. But I, I mean, I did it for 35 years, and so I'm, I'm used to it, and I know it, and, and I love it when the church does it. But I also love contemporary Christian. I love gospel music, dancing, and rowdy, and trumpets. And the, we, we did this song last week. It's a song by a, an artist named Ron Cannoli. It's a song called Ancient of Days. And it's a great song. Uh, but there's one place where there's this incredibly rowdy horn part. And we just baptized a professional trumpet player. Uh, I mean, a professional trombone player. And so we have another trombone player. So we had the keyboard playing trumpet sound, a synthesizer. And then we had these two guys on, on trombones. The church went nuts. They were, yeah! You know, they were so fired up, you know. Praise him with the horns, great. And so, uh, and so you know, you just try different things. And then you talk to people and find out what they, what they like and what works for them and what doesn't. And sometimes you can tell by the feedback you're getting in the service. Like if everybody's sitting there going, that's probably a good sign they're not getting into it. Um, so, you know, you can learn that way too. Uh, I wonder how long do you need to prepare your draft version, draft set for Sunday? Because as I understand, that, like good, good sermon needs good preparation, also good worship service needs good preparation, but I wonder how, how long do you need 
I mean, when I first started really paying attention to it, I would say I spent a good four hours laboring over it. I've been doing them now for 10 years. I can, I can knock out a, a good solid first draft. I can knock out in about 20 minutes. But then even then, I spend, I'll spend 20 minutes today and then I'll go back and I'll spend another 15 minutes tomorrow. And then on Tuesday, I'll spend another 15 minutes and I'll start thinking through every transition. Then of course, I'll start getting feedback from my group, what they like, what they suggest. Somebody will tell me, oh, we just did that song three weeks ago. And I'll say, oh yeah, we did. So I'll choose another song. So I would say that, you know, probably by the time we get to the finished product, which may not happen till as late as Saturday, by the time we get to that finished product, I'd say we've spent a couple hours, three, four hours maybe, uh, really laboring through it. It takes some time. But if you have good minds working on it together, it, it's not all on one person, you know. Esmond. Yeah. Um, oh, you have the mic. Um, so, yeah. um, so, how would you go about uh, getting the leadership on board? You started this, uh, this last session talking about uh, being unified, being unified with the leadership. Um, and uh, uh, I've, I've, I've been trying together with the, the, the worship team back in Copenhagen to, to try to. To try to revive, to try to get people to actually worship. Uh, but one of the problems we're facing is that uh, very often the, the leadership uh, tends to, to not plan very much in advance. Uh, very often when we when, when I want to plan a, a, a worship service, then on Monday, usually everything I can be told is which two chapters of Acts is going to be the theme scriptures for this week. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know which part they're going to choose to preach from. I don't know, you know. Um, and, and another thing is that, that some, some of the people who are preaching uh, tend to preach for a very long time, up to 45 minutes, without being very skilled speakers so and, and if anything, anything can kill a worship yeah. service flow it's a an, an unskilled speaker just dragging out for 45 minutes so so we really want to get the worship to, to get the, the the leadership on board to provide worship how would you go about doing that um well two two things i would say is again most ministers i'll pick my words carefully are woefully undereducated on this particular subject. And so I think you need to buy them a book. Mm -hmm. By my book, there's lots of good books out there. Uh, but you need to get a book in their hands about worship and, and say maybe, maybe everybody together is going to read. Uh, I, have a, I have a reading list on my webpage, uh, lifechangingworship.com. And there's lots of good books on there that people can read. I think, I think you, you get a good book in their hands. Or and you say, hey, can, or you just initiate and you say, hey, can we have a, can you and I go to lunch this week and let me share with you some of the things that I learned in Budapest and, and let's have a conversation about how we can all work together to take the worship higher and do better. Uh, but I think, I think consistent conversations, most, um, I would say in America over the last 10 years, we've really been pushing this hard. Most good ministers will meet from time to time with their worship teams and just discuss the plan. Like uh, I know Sam Lang always meets with his once a month, talks about the plan for the next four Sundays. I would say again, I don't think it matters what the preacher's preaching. You know, hopefully they're going to get better at preaching. But theme-wise, I don't even worry about that. Uh, like when I'm asked to lead worship at a leader's meeting, for the whole church and, and our lead evangelist AT is going to be preaching. I don't even ask him what he's preaching. I don't care what he's preaching. It'll be awesome. I'm sure it'll be great. But my goal is in the, in the 20 minutes that he's given me, I want to lead people to the throne of God. That's my only goal. And if I can get people in front of God, I have prepared their hearts for whatever comes next, even if it's not great. In our case, it's going to be great because our guy's a great speaker. But in a lot of cases, I understand some, they're not all, not all ministers are created equal. So. Uh, you know what? We, we are, I think we're out of time. Uh, we will be around fellowshipping. Uh, if you have any other questions, then I would say 
Uh, you can talk to me, talk to Daniel, talk to Esben, uh, and there's probably talk among yourselves because I know there's a lot of expertise in the room in general. And uh, let's fellowship and come up with solutions to the challenges that we have. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, talk uh, at least an hour more about this, uh, but uh, uh, our next class is going to start in uh, almost an hour, a little bit more than an hour, 2.30. So uh, uh, we should have some lunch break now, uh, but before that, uh, Espen and I, we would uh, very shortly uh, tell you something about the classes we're going to have this afternoon. Yes, um, well, I'm going to be teaching again this afternoon. Hopefully my, uh, my cold will be uh, with me. Okay. Um, so, but uh, I just wanted to, to clarify a little bit about what the, the class is going to be about. Because I, I'm getting the impression from, from, from a couple of people that there might have been a little bit of, of confusion. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, first of all, the class is not just about conducting. In fact, we're going to be uh, continuing much on the on same thread as, uh, as Dave has begun here, this, this lesson here, uh, about going practically into how do we communicate leadership. Uh, not just worship leadership, but also musical leadership. Uh, how do we remove obstacles in that communication chain? Um, also, uh, we made sure that the plan team here made, made very sure that uh, in our schedule, it is highlighted that the class is both for brothers and sisters. So I would specifically encourage uh, sisters to uh, also attend this class. I'm sure you will get a, a lot out of it. Uh, it's going to be very practical. It's going to be a workshop uh, for three hours. So we're going to be working practically. You're going to be able to give a lot of input, a lot of suggestions. Uh, we're going to be working practically. We're also going to go into the conducting issue and work on some of the technicals of that. Thank you very much. And uh, as we had to do a little bit in parallel, uh, uh, we will have a, a class for instrumentalists, which will start a little bit later in the Esmond's class. So people have a chance to uh, whether to, 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 to stay the whole time with the uh, leading conducting class and uh, those who uh, play instruments are just interested uh, uh, are welcome at uh, 4 30 then so for one for one hour at the, in this room which has the door over there uh, for uh, the class of, uh, for instrumentalists uh, I call it Praising with Instruments, uh, as uh, many of us do. Uh, I uh, have uh, some great scriptures uh, about instruments and music in the Bible and uh, share them with you. And uh, I think we, we, we're going to also have a, just a workshop uh, around um, uh, sharing experiences with each other. Um, what is helpful, what is not helpful using our instruments. Uh, church. Um, like I said, this is a workshop, so um, uh, I, I have a, a, a bit of program planned for the beginning. I have some material that we can go through, but I want you guys to feel free uh, during uh, our workshop to, uh, to bring up uh, different questions if you have uh, specific areas that you would like to, uh, to ask about. Um, like I said yesterday, um, my, my field of work is mainly conducting and singing, um, so obviously that is that's the areas where I will be most proficient in helping you if you ask me about um, other technical uh, issues, uh, I might not be the right person to ask. Um, but feel free to uh, put up a, 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 a paw uh, during the, the session and ask questions if you have something. Also, because we, we have three hours ahead of us, we are going to uh, to take one or two short breaks during, but if you feel the sudden need for for uh, soda or coffee or tea or other kinds of drugs, then uh, 
feel free to just sneak over and uh, grab yourself something. All right. Um, so I would like to open uh, by talking a little bit to begin with about uh, what is a worship leader and what, what goes into the term worship leader. Um, and the way I usually explain it, uh, Dave uses the, the same analogy but in a little bit different context than, than, than I like to do. Um, what I usually do is I, I compare, uh, I say that, that as a worship leader we have two different obligations. Uh, the reason we are on stage, we have two different jobs to do. Um, the one focus we need to have is, I keep turning up the volume in my place. One is the worship goes into the word, right? Um, so as a worship leader, I have an obligation to be worshiping God. Dave has been talking a, a lot about that and uh, I believe we're all on the, the same page. We need to be worshipers first and foremost um, before we can be worship leaders. Um, and, and then that, I like to call it a, 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 the vertical uh, focus on the vertical direction. But we have another direction as well. Um, we also have the leader function. Uh, and that is the horizontal focus. Because we are, uh, we are also leading the congregation. So we need to have a focus on our congregation um, in order to lead them. And you see the, you see the nice little cross analogy here. The, yes? Um, anyway, so um, so what, what goes into this? Well, uh, so now we know we have these two focuses in order to be worship leaders. Um, but what happens if, uh, if I'm on stage and, and something causes me to, to not worship? It can, be, it can be different things. It can be uh, either I'm too timid, I, I don't really, I, I become too self-aware, think too much about oh, what will people think if I start raising my hands or... I mean, we live in a, a culture where, um, where it's not viewed upon as, as a positive thing to stand out. Um, so that has been built into most of us, at least from, from early childhood, that we shouldn't be different from the rest. Well, I, I believe that worshipping uh, God is to stand out. I mean, we need to strive for excellence. Um, so if I, for some reason, I'm afraid of, um, of, uh, of being too expressive or I'm too self-aware, so maybe I don't dare being very expressive in my worship, uh, then I stop worshiping. Another thing could be, um, some of us are, are trained musicians. I was a, a musician for, for some years before I became a Christian. Um, so when I got involved with the, the worship team, I had to start relearning how to do music. Because as, as professional musicians, we are performers. We are putting on a show. Um, we are, are acting for the, the, the audience. But as, as worshipers, we have a completely different function. Um, so, so I believe we all have to, if we are musicians by trade, we all have to start relearning uh, our trade from, from scratch. Um, so that can cause us to stop worshipping. So if, if that goes away, then we are no longer worship leaders, we are just leaders. Right? Um, another thing that can happen is maybe we, for some reason, we lose the connection with, uh, with the congregation. Uh, that can be many things. It can be that I'm just standing up here having a whole little party, um, and forgetting everybody, everything about uh, people in the room, Forget, forgetting everything, everything about leading them, which can work because if, if that little party helps you guys to do the same thing, to also have your, your party for God, then that's a good thing. Then we are leading the congregation. But if we, in that process, if we lose the congregation, then we are no longer, we are no longer, uh, we no, no, no longer have the horizontal thing. Uh, the most common thing uh, is that something gets obscured in the communication. We're going to be looking at, at, at those obstacles uh, when we get a little bit further here. Um, 
So, because all leading is communication, and when we are leading something, someone, we are, in essence, communicating something to them. But if they don't understand what we are communicating, because we are not clear and intuitive in our communication, then we lose the horizontal um, connection too, and then we stop being worship leaders. Now we are just worshippers, which means that we are really just a waste of space on stage. We might as well be down on the floor with all the rest of the worshippers, right? Um, so that means that we need to be super clear in our communication and we need to be super focused on worshipping God at the same time. That requires some focus. Um, so what is worship leading? Uh, I would like to try and, and put a few words on, uh, on worship leading. Um, you probably have some, some more words than I do. We can, you can uh, feel free to, to put up a call. But some of the words that I have, um, uh, I've been putting on it is that we are inspiring. Inspiring people uh, to inspire. Uh, literally means to, to inspire. It comes from, from Latin, which means to, to fill something with breath uh, or with spirit. Um, and so we're, we're literally filling each other with, with the spirit um, when we are inspiring each other. And I believe the Bible calls us to do that. Another thing we do, we are encouraging. We're encouraging uh, the congregation to, to do the same as we do. We're encouraging people to worship God. And we have that in, in for example, in, in Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another daily. So we're all called to encourage. Um, we're being an example. Paul calls Timothy to be an example. So we are presenting an example for the congregation in, in how, uh, how to worship God. Um, we're also spurring one another on. You know, come on, you know, don't you want to go to that land? Um, we're, we're spurring each other on, giving each other energy. Come on, this is also a biblical thing. We're all called to do that. Um, and we're going in front. Um, I would like to uh, I would like to read a scripture actually, uh, because if you look at the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, uh, you see the leaders uh, in, in through, throughout Israel's history when they went out to battle, the leader uh, and usually also the worship team were in front of the army. Um, except when you look at, for example, a guy like David, in his youth. He was the, the, the leader who was in front and out with his, his army. But then when he got older and he got his castle and, and all his wives and everything, he sent out um, the, 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 the army to battle, but he stayed home. And, and what happened? Well, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and he had uh, her husband killed to cover over his sin. So he was probably not in a very good spiritual place at that time. Maybe he should have gone out in front uh, like all the rest of the leaders. So um, I would like to um, uh, I would like to read a scripture in a few moment, uh, moments um, but first uh, first I would like to just look at these five things uh, you, you probably have more words uh, but I think what's common for these five things is that this goes for any Christian not just for worship leaders or, or preachers uh, or uh, whoever else is, is, is performing some sort of leadership service. This goes for any Christian. We are all called to do this, whether we are brothers or sisters or drummers or lead singers uh, or part singers or whatever we're doing. There's a hand down there, yeah? Yes, uh, I hope it's not an unnecessary interruption. My question is that uh, uh, here in Budapest uh, we uh, use uh, camera the lyrics for the, for the congregation. To show what, sorry? The show the lyrics. Yeah. And uh, so uh, people don't uh, look at us, they look at the right. lyrics there. Mm -hmm. So we don't have uh, a connection with the, with, the, with, the, with the church. So what do you suggest? Mm -hmm. what, what shall we do? Yeah, I would like to actually, uh, I would like to actually park that question for a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so please remember it. We'll get back to it uh, once we get to the obstacles in communication. 
Um, so I'll get back to you, I promise you. Um, the, 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 the bottom line for this is that all of this requires communication. Just like you're saying, we need to communicate um, to be able to do these things. Otherwise, we're not reaching anybody. We're not performing our duties. Um, let's just for a second turn to uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20. <clears throat> and I'm having my traveling Bible here, which is very small. So it's very small letters for me, but I'll try to read it anyway. All right, and I put it up on screen also for you. This is even smaller. So, in chapter 20 it says here, this is about uh, uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, and he's on his way uh, to battle. And it says here, early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God. This is a different translation than that one up there. I can see that. Have faith in the Lord of God, uh, the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. <coughs> and then it says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. To so sing and praise, right? Um, as they went out ahead of the army. And this, this translation actually says that he appointed some to praise the splendor of his holiness. And then when they went out in front of the armed forces, this is the worship verse he's talking about, they were singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his faithful love endures forever. And the moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord sent an ambush against the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir, who came to fight against Judah, and they were defeated. So the leader goes in front of the battle. And when we do that, it says you that, that God was with them, right? Um, I'd like to show you um, a little picture I found on uh, Google. Um, uh, and it illustrates, uh, it illustrates the concept of leading um, the way that I, I believe that the Bible teaches us to lead. It looks like this. So up, up in, the, in the top you have the boss who is sitting there and he's going, Go that way! Pull me! Pull me! Right? Uh, this is the guy with the whip. Um, that's the boss. And then underneath you have the leader, who is going in front, inspiring the rest to pull with him. So let's go back to, to what is worship leading. Well, I believe, um, this is my firm conviction, that everybody on stage, whether you are the, the lead singer in front, or you are the part singer on the side, or you are the guy hiding behind the drum kit, maybe even in a cage or something. Everybody on stage is a worship leader. Um, and then yesterday we had a, a question about the sisters. Uh, because I know that there are some people, in, especially uh, in, in our movement, who have uh, some reservations about sisters leading. So what about the sisters? What about 1 Timothy 2.12? And uh, first, let me say, I know that there are different uh, interpretations of this. There are uh, different opinions, different convictions. I would like to just present my conviction, and then you can, you can take it or you can leave it. Um, you can argue with me. Um, I believe I have, have studied this, this to uh, quite a bit to reach the, the uh, conclusions that I have reached, but I, I definitely don't know everything. So, uh, but let's look a little bit at 1 Timothy 2.12. Um, we have it here. It says, Paul says here to Timothy, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to be silent. Um, now here is 
First of all, my conviction about this, um, the way I read First and Second Timothy, is that Paul is talking specifically, the way I read those two letters, about <coughs> biblical authority. Now, Timothy, um, Timothy, Timothy was an evangelist. Um, so Paul is talking to him about how to be an evangelist. Um, and in... Uh, uh, we, we can get back to that. So I believe he's talking about um, about biblical authority, biblical teaching. So, uh, for example, I would, what, what I do here right now, I'm teaching from the Bible. I think that would probably go under biblical teaching. And what Dave has been doing today would also probably go under biblical teaching. But that doesn't mean that uh, a girl, a woman, a sister can't be a teacher in a, a public school, right? Um, and, uh, and, and about authority, um, let me give you an example here. Um, every year, uh, the last five days of December, we have a, a, a retreat in Copenhagen. We have a, we call it the, the Nordic New Year's Camp. And it's from the 28th of December and to the ending on the 1st of January. So we're together for five days. Just being a family at a retreat, we're usually about 100 people. Um, and 100 people for five days, they require a lot of food. And uh, the last many years, as long as I can remember, uh, a sister we have uh, called Casilla. Uh, she's a very, very talented cook. Um, and she has been in charge of the food for the whole camp. And she basically starts in like February trying out new recipes, figuring out what would go well, how to do this, which ingredients would we need. She starts planning all the ingredients uh, for all the, the meals. We're having three meals a day, plus coffee and cake and everything. Um, and she starts planning that. And then as you get to December, uh, her husband, who's an engineer, he has made a, a very nifty little Excel spreadsheet uh, for her, where she can just plug in the recipes with all the ingredients. Uh, so how many, how many, how much do you need for one person? And then it calculates how much uh, to buy. How many? It, it basically gives her a shopping list. So she's in charge also of um, of having. She, she uh, commandeers some some brothers uh, to, out to carry all the heavy stuff um, to collect all these uh, goods for the the New Year's camp. And then when we get there. Um, She's in charge of the kitchen. She makes cooking teams. Uh, everybody on the, on the camp will be on a cooking team. So you are cooking a, at least two meals, and then you probably have one or two dishwashing duties also. Uh, so she makes the teams. And for the, for the team who is having the cooking duty, she's in charge of the kitchen. And this is, just, this is brothers and sisters alike. They, they are on these teams just mixed together. And she is basically just calling the shots in the kitchen, te te teaching them, you know, what, what do you put there? You need to stir that thing, can you, um, can you put that in the oven, right? That has to go now, and then we need to take it out. And she has every, all the strings in the kitchen. So is Cassia, is she sinning when she's doing this? Is she in violation with 1 Timothy 2.12? No. I believe absolutely not. No. Right. Um, so, let's look a little bit at, at the term to have authority over. Um, it, it, the Greek Bible, it derives from uh, the word authentain, which is a conjugation of authenteo. Um, and that means to domineer, to govern, to have mastery over. And remember, this is in a, a biblical context. Um, and the word in itself is a combination of office, which means self, yourself, or to be, uh, you have the, the automobile, that is uh, uh, something that is mobile by itself. You don't have to pedal, right? Um, and then you have the antea, which means arms or armor. So this literally means to, to take up arms, to arm yourself. Um, or if you use it about a person, it means literally, Someone who, with his own hand, or her own hand, uh, either kills either others or himself. 
literally. Um, and and uh, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 2 and 5, uh, Paul uses the terms to correct and rebuke. Um, so I believe these are the, the, the kind of uh, verbs, the kind of uh, activity that Paul is talking about when he's talking about having authority over a man. Now the question is, the real question right now is, how much authority does a worship leader have? I would say zip. In this context at least. I mean we have, we have authority uh, over choosing the songs. We put together the program. That usually takes some, some skill. Um, but we can't kick someone out of church if they're not repenting. That would be the, the church leader who would do that, right? Um, so I believe this is my convictions again. You, you, you may have another conviction. Uh, but I believe that 2 Timothy, um, sorry, 1 Timothy 2.12, uh, in my opinion, does not have anything to do with worship leading. Um, so I would like to give you a, another example. A few years ago, I was uh, uh, handed the opportunity to, or someone asked me to uh, do the sound I was a sound engineer at uh, the women's meeting at the Nordic Missions Conference in Ekre, uh, in, uh, it's in this ocean between Sweden and Finland, and we have it every summer. Um, and I was, uh, I was asked to do the sound, and um, this was a unique opportunity for me to witness what happens when you take a worship team and you suddenly take out all the brothers. Out of, the, out of the equation, what happens then? Um, because what I saw was you had a stage with, with these very, very talented women, talented singers, uh, great hearts for God, very enthusiastic, but they had no clue what to do. They had no clue how to lead a group of 150 women in worship because no one ever bothered to teach them. Right? Um, so I believe, we talked yesterday about what is a talent. Um, and I believe that the talents we have, we are given from God. And the term I used, the, the definition I used yesterday was that a talent is a potential to develop a skill. So having a talent doesn't mean that we have developed the skill yet. Uh, or we can have developed the skill some, but there may be, or usually is, a lot of more development to do. Now, I believe that if you hold someone back from developing a skill that God has given them, then you are in sin. You are in violation with the Bible. We need to train our sisters. We need to uh, let our sisters develop their talents for leading. And I am totally in agreement with uh, Dave from, from yesterday. I see, uh, biblically, nothing wrong with, with letting a sister conduct a song. Especially, I mean, many of, of our churches in Europe, we are 50 people or less. We have 41 people back in, uh, 41 disciples back in, in Denmark. Uh, in Denmark, we have two, two of us that are working with music professionally. So, so but, but many churches, uh, or in society anywhere, really, musical talent is not just growing on trees. We need, we need to use all the talents that we have. And, and if your church, if the strongest conductor in your church is a woman, a sister, why not let her conduct? I believe that, that it is unbiblical to hold someone back from, from using the talent. Um, and we need to train our sisters. But we need to deal that, that there will be some obstacles. Um, we can't just. Uh, without warning, just throw a, a sister up on stage. Because, like I said, some have different opinions about this subject. And some have, have very, very strong or, or deep felt opinions about uh, sisters conducting. Um, so I believe there is, there is an obstacle there to be dealt with. Uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 8 and 9, Paul is talking about our, our rights, the rights that we've been given. Uh, in this case, specifically about sacrificial meat, but I think this goes for this also. He says, but be careful 
that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. So if, if, we, if we throw a, a sister up to conduct a song and we have a few brothers uh, in, in the congregation who maybe take that, uh, take that heart, they get a, 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 a bad, um, what's the word, uh, um, attitude. Uh, they get a bad attitude at it, or they, they have a bad conscience maybe being, being led, what they feel is being led by, by a woman. We need to deal with that first. Uh, and if we know we have someone there, and then before we try to put a, a woman on stage to conduct, I believe we need to, to take those people aside and, and, and teach them. Um, to teach them that there is nothing biblically wrong with having a woman conducting, because in essence it is not the kind of leading Paul is talking about. All right. Um, so let's get a little bit back to the, the actual leading. Um, I just wanted to deal with that first, and, and uh, because, because like I said earlier, we had to actually emphasize in the program that this class is both <coughs> for brothers and sisters. Uh, because it is so ingrained in us uh, that, that when we see something about leading, then, then some people automatically assume, well, this is not for sisters, so I'll just go have lunch and have coffee or something. Um, so we had to really, really make sure that we encouraged you sisters to, to come here. And if you sisters are back home and you feel that you are not being trained, then I believe that you, uh, you uh, need to ask for it. Ask your, your worship leader or your evangelist or whatever, uh, talk to them and ask for training. Maybe not for, for, for just for, for leading a song, but I believe that you need those skills at least if nothing else, then to when, when you are faced in a situation like the one I faced in Ecuador a couple of years ago, and you are to lead a, a women's meeting, you need to have those skills. We, we brothers, we don't see that because we don't go to the women's meetings. Yeah. Uh, so we don't see what happens when we, when we are not there. We just assume that everything is okay. Um, so there's an awareness and there's some teaching that needs to happen. All right. Um, Leading requires communication. Um, here's a, another little quote from Paul. This is from when he's talking about speaking in tongues. Uh, he had this problem uh, in the church of, of Corinth that, that some people would speak in tongues and nobody would understand what they were saying. Uh, there, are, there are some churches uh, in, in, in the world that still have this problem. Um, and he, he says, about this, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? In other words, when we are communicating something, we need to be clear. If I want to, uh, if I want to say something to uh, to our son, what, what's your name down there? Joel. Sorry. Joel. 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 Okay. If I want to say something important to you. And, I, and just imagine that I'm not wearing a mic, maybe I'm just you know, sitting down. Uh, and we have a room full of people talking, and you're in the other side of the room. And I want to say something really, really important. Hey, uh, brother, your, uh, your, your plane is two hours early. You need to be at the airport two hours early. Um, then, if because of the noise or because of the distance, but then if he doesn't understand what I'm saying, if he doesn't hear me, or maybe he doesn't... Uh, maybe he doesn't see me speaking to him or hear me speaking to him at all, he just, he's not even aware. Then he gets to the airport two hours late and his plane is gone and he comes back and says, Hey Espen, why didn't you tell me? You knew my, that my plane was two hours late, uh, two hours early? Why didn't you tell me? And I go, well, I didn't tell you. Well, did I really? Whose fault was it? Did I really tell him if I didn't make sure that he actually understood the language I was communicating to him? Hmm? Or, or another example, um, most of my notes for this, this class I did in Danish. I could have chosen to do this class in Danish. Yeah. <laughs> right? You, you, Danish, yeah. you probably wouldn't have understood a lot about, a lot about what, I, I mean, what I would be saying. It would still be the same thing. So I still told you, right? Men jeg vil være rimelig dum, hvis jeg stillede mig herop og snakkede på dansk. Og så tror jeg, I forstod, hvad jeg sagde, ikke? 
What I said, exactly. What I said was, I would be, actually, it would be quite stupid if I got up here and I spoke to you in Danish and assumed that you would get just a clue about what I was saying. The same thing goes when we're leading. We need to have a clear language, verbally or non-verbally. A language that is so intuitive that people understand what we are communicating. Otherwise, we're not communicating at all. So let's just go back to, um, to our, uh, our slide about worshiping. Um, so my first point was that everyone on stage is a worship leader. And if, if what we are communicating from stage is not clear, then we are not communicating, communicating at all, which means that we are not leading. At all. Uh, Dave used a, a good example yesterday, and I actually intended to uh, use the same example, but you, you stole it from me, bro. Um, when uh, I have another function back in Copenhagen, when we have foreign disciples coming to Copenhagen, I'm usually uh, the guy who's showing people around town. Um, and so I have a, a couple of places that I have. have read a few things about, I can, can tell a few interesting facts, I have a couple of routes, I know how to get there, you know, which way to go. Um, so, to show people around, I need, first of all, I need to know where we're going. I need to know where are we going. This doesn't just, just go for worship, I mean, David's telling us, yeah, we're going in front of the, 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 the throne of God. Yes, but which direction do we need to go to get there, right? Um, it could be musically. Let's say we're doing a song that needs to be quiet and intimate. Then I need to communicate quiet and intimate because quiet and intimate is where we are going. So how do I communicate that? Or just super practically, if we for some reason are repeating the last chorus, but it's just it's still on the slides. The, the lyrics are just there. We did that uh, this morning. Uh, actually, there was a song where we repeated the, the last chorus. Nothing happens on the slides. Then if I don't, as a worship leader, communicate that we are repeating it, then what happens, what we see, uh, I, I'm sure you have experienced this, this just as many times as I have, if not more. What happens is that the congregation, they will be silent for the first line, and then they will join in because, ah, oh, we're doing the first chorus, we're doing the chorus again. Or, oh, we're going back to the first verse. That's where we're going. We need to know where we're going, and we need how to. We need to know not just to get there, but how to get everybody there. If I'm showing uh, people around town, and I'm just going where I'm going, but they maybe the Americans are, are especially bad at this. They usually stop uh, to look at the shops. Wow, oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh, that, oh that's, that's expensive, man. Oh my goodness. And then I'm just off. And I'm there, well, hey, where did you guys go? We just have a learning spirit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we have a learning disability. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to know not just how to get there, but how to get everybody there. Just, yeah. This is super practical. It's a, a thing like signaling that we are repeating a verse. You know, or signaling a, 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 a ritardando in the end. How do we signal that? so that everybody gets where we're going. Uh, I have a, a brother back in Copenhagen, uh, he's a, a human resources specialist, and one of the things he likes to say is, uh, is that if you don't know where you're going, you're pretty sure not to get there. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's uh, I'll try to, to define a few uh, overall Principles. We had yesterday. We had the overall principles of healthy singing. So I tried to do the same with uh, with leading. Um, and the first principle I have defined is that leading must be intuitive. When we are leading from stage, people don't have very much time to stand and think about what's the guy mean. What does that guy mean? You know, we we as worship leaders, we can do that when we are sitting and we are planning the set. Uh, we can 
Oh, so you want to do the, the, the first verse after the last chorus again. Ah, I see. But uh, but how do we get... Oh, maybe there's a key change. We, we have the time to try and sit and understand these things. The congregation don't. They have to understand it instantly. And here's my second principle. Do not disturb the congregation. This is actually a principle that I outright stole from uh, my old conducting teacher when I was taking my conducting education. He used to say, do not disturb the musicians while they are playing. <laughs> Meaning that if I'm up here and I'm waving my arms all over the place, I'm communicating a lot of things that I don't really need, need to communicate, I'm just like, it. that would be like, I'm going, hey brother, hi, how are you doing? Hi, hi, you know, I'm just, and after a while he's going to get tired, right? Uh, <laughs> he's going to keep me somewhere or something. Um, if I'm waving my arms, I'm sending all kinds of signals, I'm disturbing the congregation. We're going to be talking a little bit later about what kind of disturbances uh, we can have. But the point is to get rid of the disturbances, the, the, all, all the things that will take the, the congregation's attention away from what they need to have their attention on. Uh, and we're also going to be talking about how to remove the obstacles. Uh, the obstacles, for example, the example if I'm trying to communicate across the room, where we have, a, we have an obstacle in the middle, uh, we have maybe a whole group of, of loud people. Uh, uh, so, so there's this, this huge object, uh, metaphysically speaking, metaphorically speaking, in the middle that we need to get rid of for the message to get through. So, what are some disturbances or obstacles that we may be facing? Now, this is where I'm going to open up for, um, uh, for input, if you uh, have any suggestions. What kind, of, what kind of obstacles or what kind of disturbances do we, um, do we face when we are leading? Anyone? There's a hand there, yeah? People. People who are walking in the room, doesn't matter what else, going to the toilet, going to the preacher with the microphone, um, standing up, sitting down, uh, running around, um, especially at quiet songs. So you're talking about uh, the congregation being too busy, or some people being too busy around the room while something's going on. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, let's call that... Uh, Busy people. I hope you can read my uh, my letter. So, how do we deal with that? Any suggestions? How do we deal with people running around? Yeah. So uh, there was a time uh, when in our congregation this was a uh, practice, and uh, we had uh, very strong teachings about. And, uh, and we removed the, the coffee uh, automats uh, and, uh, and, and such things. And the uh, church has been reviewed uh, those times uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for not, not being and not, not listening to the, to the preaching. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Anyone else? Yeah, Alicia? Uh, a five minute warning. Five minute warning, yeah, good one. Uh, yeah, and there. Um, one thing is when you, um, I see it myself, when I'm leading a song and someone is coming late into the room, I dare not to look there because everybody else sees my eyes mm -hmm. and when, I, when they see my eyes going wherever, then ten heads are turning also there. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about diverting people's attention from what's going on, yeah? All right, there's a hand there, Tina. I think you need to make the worship so captivating that people are not busy around uh -huh. it. That's a good one.
It goes a little bit in with the, the one before, right? That we are diverting people's attention by being so focused on stage that we basically pull people in. Um, uh, I'd like to give you uh, an example, actually, because um, uh, this spring I was at a, at a conference in uh, Raleigh, in North Carolina, and what they did there um, is that for some, of the, for some of the meetings, the worship team had planned a session uh, in, the beginning of, uh, uh, in the beginning of the meetings. The worship leaders had planned a session of, of uh, a number of songs, um, like the, the, the 20 minutes that, that Dave has been talking about to, to bring people to a state where they are ready to worship. And what they did there was, when the meeting began, as soon as the first song began, the doors were closed and locked and nobody was allowed into the room until that session of songs ended. Wow. <laughs> It also prevents people from getting out if they don't like church. <laughs> so they, they basically they had the ushers stand and tell people to wait until the worship was over. There's a hand there. Orchestra, when you have the, the people, the, the musicians, 
they're looking at their, their sheet music, they're reading their music, but they're catching the conductor's movements out of the corner of their eye. Uh, and this is still possible. You can, all of you, we, we can all catch something out of oh, what was that, right? Uh, so we can still get a notion of what's going on. Of course, this, uh, this poses a, a requirement to the person who is leading that he is so clear that, um, that even when, it, when the leading is just perceived out of the corner of the eye, um, then it is still understood the way it's intended. And also, I think that we, uh, we're going to get to that when we get to the actual conducting part. Uh, but one of the, the basic principles of conducting um, is, the, is the don't disturb the musicians while you're playing principle. Um, and, and what it basically means is that we only need to conduct what needs conducting. It's very, very often that I, I see worship leaders uh, go up um, and they go, soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Right? They're waving their arms around to a rhythmical song where you basically just need to go, soon and very soon, and you just have the rhythm in your body. Maybe you have a band doing the rhythm. You don't need to be waving your arms. You're just dragging people's <laughs> attention away, right? What are, you, what are you communicating? You're communicating a tempo that people are getting from, from the singers and the guitar and the drums and the piano, right? So, so you're just wasting energy and you're wasting, you're exhausting people's attention. And what happens also, if you conduct, if you insist on conducting everything, what happens is that you exhaust people's attention. Because very, very quickly, people learn that they're not really getting anything from these movements because they're not communicating anything. So they, they ignore them, start ignoring them. So what happens when you actually do need to conduct something? When you actually do need to conduct a, a ritadando, or a, a dragging out of the tempo, or when there's actually something you need to conduct, maybe making something more quiet or louder, and people are not looking at you because you have taught them that, you, that your arms don't mean anything, they're not conducting anything, right? You're just waving your arms in thin air. I mean, if you're raising your arms, that would be a different thing, because that would not be conducting, that would be crazy, right? Um, but these arms, they're not communicating. So, um, so that's also, that can also be a disturbance to remove that. So only conduct what needs to be conducted. Because then people will learn that when you start conducting, then they need to look at you. But for the rest of the time, they can just trust their ear. Yeah. Most people have good ears. They can follow a, a, a drummer, mm. right? You just need a tempo and then they go. Most musicians can just be counted in and then they just go. They keep the tempo. There was a hand there. Um, speaking of communicating precisely, I think that's also something that the, the song leaders, the sight singers, kind of need to learn. Absolutely. Because I often see um, people clapping, or then someone claps, and then someone snaps their hand, and it's not clear which one it is. And then I try to, like at home, I try to tell the sight singers, you need to make your movements bigger. Because if you clap like this, then no one's going to see it from up there. And especially if you have a music stand in front of you, then people won't even be able to see your hand movements. Right. And I think the song leaders have learned to make bigger movements, and mm -hmm. at least I think our song leaders are doing a good job. But the side singers often don't like be very small movements, and it's, mm -hmm. and for me, if I sit in the audience, I sometimes don't even see what they're doing, mm -hmm. and that kind of disturbs me because then I don't know whether I should be clapping or snipping or snapping or doing whatever something like that. I am a I'm a huge uh, spokesperson for planning those things. <coughs> Plan it ahead. When you're doing the planning for the service, also plan how you're going to build it up. How are we going to have the, the snapping from the, the chorus? Maybe on the last word, where we're we going to be clapping? And make sure that everybody on the, the singing team, and even the musicians, they know that. Um, so they know exactly when to start. And then when you, when you start, like you say, you don't just do like that. You go, right? So that everybody knows that now we're going to clap. To be really expressive, 
That's also something we can go into in the, in the conducting. I actually have a clapping exercise uh, for you guys uh, later on. Uh, how to get, you know, how to get people to, to clap. So we can, we can do that after, uh, after a break, uh, when we go into conducting. Um, there was a, a hand down there, Alicia, you had a hand? Yeah, I was thinking about um, the, the, the leader. I was in Stockholm, our leader was a guitarist. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in Stockholm, the leader was a guitarist. And um, he was not able to do this. And so we were able to eventually read him just by his, just by one little look in his face. Mm -hmm. and, and everything that he did, all of his body language was able to show, let's get, let's get louder, let's get yeah. more energized towards the end, or let's calm down a little bit. Can we just come a little bit closer to him? And, and every little thing that he did really helped mm -hmm. us to just read all of the body language. Yes. And so it, it's a big uh, signifier that you don't have to be so wide in your yeah. hands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to um, I would like to, to take this opportunity to just uh, puncture a balloon that some people have that conducting is just about what your hands are doing. Conducting is everything that your body is doing. Uh, conducting can even be verbal. Uh, you can be shouting ahead, "What's the next line going to be?" Or you can, you know, like you say, you can just do it with your voice. Lower your voice and you start singing more quietly, uh, then the congregation will most probably also catch that. That is also conducting because you are uh, conducting the music uh, in, in some of the ways that we're going to talk about what conducting is. Um, uh, absolutely. And another thing I know that they do in Stockholm is that they actually have, uh, or used to have, now Christians moved to, to Copenhagen, but uh, they used to have two leaders. They used to have the front man, David, uh, who is the, the guitarist, he's the, the, the worship uh, leader leader, if you can say so. Um, but then Christen, Alicia's husband, was doing the band leading from the piano. So he was leading the band, so he could focus on, on getting the musicians with him. Um, and then, so he just had to follow, follow David, and then David could focus on on the uh, on the con congregation fully that doesn't didn't have to worry too much about what's the the drummer going to do and what's the other guys going to do. Um, I think that's a very very good idea if you have that opportunity if you have an opportunity to have uh, one of the musicians to be the music leader and then have a guy in front who is the the worship leader leader. Um, I don't know what else to say. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, another just oh, sorry, yeah, you had a hand. Oh, you first, okay. Uh, how how can you make the congregation follow you uh, when you want to make the the song soft? Uh huh. I tried this with the, also with the gesture and with the softer voice, but <coughs> everybody sings loud. Right. So, <laughs> Uh, well, that's because it's like that's that's probably uh, there's probably some reason uh, for not. I mean, it, it can be because the, the congregation is, is just in their own world uh, and they're not following you. Uh, but most likely, most likely, it's it's because you can probably be clearer in the way you're communicating. Uh, so we're also going to go into conducting dynamics. Uh, when we go into the conducting, the actual conducting session, um, which we're going to get to uh, in a little while. Um, so we, yeah, absolutely. Con dynamics is, is also one of the things that we're conducting when we're conducting. Um, no, um, I see where you're going, and um, and it, it is possible that that the congregation then needs to to be awoken to the idea, because it could be that they, maybe they're not worshipping at all, maybe they're just belting out lyrics that they don't know anything, you know, they don't think about what they're actually communicating, they're just belting out something they learned by heart but never thought about what they're singing. Uh, I, I think it was a year ago 
I did, uh, we did a, a session and I did a, a, a two uh, classes back in Copenhagen on, on worship. That was the first, first real step towards trying to get more worship focused in our church. Um, so I did a, a session uh, where I shared, one of the things I shared was, uh, or talked about was the, 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 the apologetics that we talked about yesterday about what all the, the chemicals that gets released in your brain um, all the things that happen to um, to your brain when you're singing and when you're singing together, and we looked at the Psalms and we looked at some scripture about about what what worship should be, and what happened was that for about three weeks after that, something really dramatic changed in the way that our congregation worshipped. Uh, the first the first Sunday after this this class, one of the brothers pulled me aside and said, hey bro, you know, I, was, I, I never thought about what these lyrics mean and this was just such an impacting experience. Thank you, bro. Um, and that, that worked for about three weeks. And then they started forgetting uh, uh, because then some other teachings came. And, and um, so, so I definitely think that, that it would also help to have teaching on, on, on what worship is supposed to be. And, and, and just a simple thing like, how do you dissect lyrics? How do you interpret them? Um, you, can, you can easily teach about that. Take some songs with your congregation at, at your midweeks or something and, and go over the lyrics with them. Or have, um, one of the things that I, I'm planning to do back in Copenhagen is I would like to do uh, a reading of Amazing Grace. It's like read the lyrics as if it was a poem because it's actually very strong lyrics. But that's one of the songs, it's, it's probably in, in the, all of the, the Christian world, uh, even, I mean, even including churches that profess to be Christian, this is probably the, the, the world top one hymn being sung all over the world, Amazing Grace. And yet so few people think about what it actually is they're singing. Because it's so used that people just learn it by heart. So they can just, they can do it while they're washing dishes or half asleep. You know, um, so they, they, they don't think about what the lyrics mean. Yeah. Just don't call me a wrench. Yeah. <laughs> wrench, maybe. But. <laughs> All right. Uh, and you had a hand? Yeah? yeah. Uh, my next question uh, is about the technical issues. Um, you said um, the worship leader is someone on the stage. Mm -hmm. I disagree a little bit. I think without the people off the stage, you can't worship. You're absolutely you can't right. Lead. Uh, we need, uh, especially when we have bigger congregations, we need all the technical stuff mm -hmm. uh, to bring it to all the other people. Mm -hmm. So how to um, communicate with the people who have the technical skills and how to deal with technical problems like um, I don't know the English works but quick problem and whatever happens with the sound. I would I mean we don't use a lot of technical stuff in Copenhagen. We're a very small church. Um, but I think a very good idea would be to bring them in uh, in your worship team meetings. Um, let them participate in the teachings and worship and let them let them understand and, and this this goes also for uh, for anybody on stage, really, that that they are they are a huge link in the chain between the communication being sent from stage and the congregation. If you have a, a conference of uh, 300 people, then if you didn't have the technical people, then only a few people in the front <coughs> would catch what the speaker is saying. Yeah. Um, so, so the technical people play a huge role. If you didn't have the, the lighting people, if you have lighting people, I don't have lighting people. If you didn't have the lighting people, people would maybe hear the sound, but they wouldn't see what's going on, right? And the lighting people have, they have a, a, a huge advantage because they have uh, the possibility for uh, affecting people's mood without people even being aware of it. Um, most people, unless you're like literally blind or colorblind or something, uh, most people uh, are affected by the color of light. Uh, I did, um, 
before I became a Christian, I had a, a very small uh, sound and lighting company. So I did some lighting design for some musicals. Um, and, and one of the things you really work with in theater is the mood of a scene. And, and different colors have different mood meanings. Like if you're giving a, a if you're setting the light uh, in, in bluish, cold colors, that will give either a, 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 a fearful or maybe a sorrowful or depressing um, emotion, a sad emotion. If you're using warm colors, that will give happy emotions. And so you can you can actually play with people's emotions without they, them even noticing it. But if the, the, the technical people, if they, if they don't think of themselves as participating in the leading, then they, they're not even maybe aware of this. Um, so I would definitely bring them into the, the meetings and, and that help them to understand that they are a huge part of the worship ministry. Right. Okay, um, another obstacle that I would like to throw in at this point, this is actually a disturbance. Um, I've been debating with myself a little bit whether to, um, to, to bring this up with you, but, um, but I think I decided to, so, so I hope you can, can forgive me for just you know, speaking just completely honestly. When I, uh, when I told people back in Copenhagen that I was going to go down here and, and teach, there was uh, a brother who pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, brother, uh, you're, going to, you're going to teach all these worship leaders of Europe. And this, this brother has, has traveled a lot in, 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 in Europe. So he, he's been to different churches and different con uh, uh, conferences and stuff. He said, so that means that that you have a, the, the, a unique opportunity to tell them that enthusiasm and heart for God does not equal volume. <laughs> and I, I stopped for a second and I was like, bro, what, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, there, there are these, these worship leaders, um, because I mean, we, we, we all agree that worship is loud sometimes, yeah. right? Um, and it's definitely energetic sometimes. Um, but he said, yeah, you know, there, there are these, these worship leaders uh, around Europe, some, somewhere, you know, some of the, the worship leaders, and, and I'm just quoting what he said now. Um, he said, some of the worship leaders, their voices are really ugly. <laughs> I was like, bro, I can't go on stage and tell them that. <laughs> I'm going to teach a class on singing where one of my main points are going to be that we separate taste and technique. We do not talk about taste when we're talking about singing technique. Um, and, 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 and I mean, so I can't, can't go on stage and, and, and tell them that. Uh, so, so I talked to him a little bit more, and it turns out that what he, his point was that he's, he, f he feels, feels that, that some worship leaders um, are frequently singing out of pitch. And then, then he was starting to speak my language, because I was telling you yesterday, that was one of the things I ended the lesson with. That pitch problems can always be corrected with correct technique. Right? Tone deafness is a myth. It does not exist. Anyone can learn to sing in pitch. And uh, in fact, if once you start uh, applying correct singing technique, then you will automatically be in pitch. So then he was starting to speak my language. And then I started understanding that what he's actually talking about is that, that some worship leaders, uh, their lack of technique in singing is creating a disturbance for him, um, which which disturbs his worship of God so much that that he's curling his toes because the, the, the guy or some people on stage are out of pitch instead of being free to worship God. Um, and and I, I'm I'm not saying this to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, I know that all of you, you have great hearts for God. You're all very talented people. And, and yesterday we talked about that everyone, per definition, is a talented singer. Because a talent is a potential to develop a skill. And since we are all called to sing, and God has built all these things into our brain to react to singing, then we are, per definition, 
talented singers. Some of us have, have uh, different degrees of developing that talent into skill. And I think we need to be honest and loving enough uh, and humble enough. To, you were talking about that earlier also about the humility part. We need to be humble enough to talk to each other about these things. To go to a brother and say, hey, you know, brother, I think it would be really, really helpful for the congregation if, if you would go home and, and, and really practice your technique. Um, or we need to be humble enough for ourselves to go and ask each other, or maybe just the congregation, hey, so, so are there, what, which, which things do you feel that I could improve in my, uh, in my worship leading? Um, and, and, and what we need to, be, to remember then is that we are called to tell each other the truth. But we are called to tell each other the truth in love. Right? So if the truth is that this brother or sister is consistently out of pitch, I think we need to let them know that. Sometimes we, we say the truth without love, and that's when some people's feelings get hurt. But more frequently, we tend to be more loving than truthful, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That we, when when someone you know someone's asking, uh, you know, we ask we ask someone about if there's something we can improve. They go, ah, I, I think you're doing great, man. You're doing a great job. And then we go off by ourselves and think, oh, I just wish you were singing pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so we need a certain amount of truth and love among one another. Right? And, and, and if a person is, if a worship leader on stage is not singing in pitch, uh, or, or something else is distracting the congregation, in his voice, or his technique, or his instrument, if, if something is distracting the congregation from worship, then I think it's, it's perfectly, per perfectly in its place to to have that worship leader, that person, to go home and practice and then maybe do something else on stage uh, or off stage until he or she has, has improved. Uh, because we are called to lead people to the throne of God and if what we are doing is doing the opposite, then we are not leading, no matter how hard we try. That's, that's my conviction. Um, all right. I think it's time to uh, to take a short break, unless there are some other um, uh, other obstacles that some of you want to talk about. No questions. All right. Let's uh, let's do a break until five minutes uh, uh, until four thirty-five. So that is nine minutes. Does that make sense? What we want to do till.